everybody. Welcome to another weekly webinar here at Route Consultant. Uh, if you've never been here before, if you've never met me, my name is Josh Gregory. I lead the education team here at Route Consultant. Uh, all that means for you is if you're a current contractor, we're here to continue to help hopefully provide education and keep you updated on everything happening in the industry. And if you're a new buyer looking to get into the space or even just understand it for the first time, we're always going to be here providing content and also answering questions, you know, whatever it may be that comes up. Um, now, before I get too much farther, I do have to quickly read a disclaimer as I do every week. So Route Consultant is not endorsed by and is not recommended by Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. Route Consultant is not sponsored by, is not approved by, is not associated with, and has no connection whatsoever with Federal Express Corporation, FedEx Ground, or Amazon. So uh, for all of our regular attendees, welcome back. And whether you're here live or watching on YouTube, welcome. Um, now, if you've never been here before, the, the general flow of today uh, is that we will go over some content, some, and we have a special guest here this week that we'll, I'll introduce in just a second, uh, and then we will go over any new listings that have come out this week, some upcoming events, and then it'll be a pure Q&A at the end, uh, and that can be questions about uh, what we talk about today or anything about the space as a whole. We're going to be here to answer whatever questions you all have. Uh, and so my big question, my big ask of you, though, is if you do have a question, make sure to put it in the Q&A button at the bottom of the window. If you put it in the chat or try to just raise your hand, I might miss it. So if you want your question answered, make sure you put it at the bottom of the window uh, in the Q&A button. Now, uh, for this week, we, we do have a treat. We've got uh, we've brought on a contractor that many of you may have seen before. Many of you know we've had him on a couple of times here. Uh, his name is Marlon Campbell, and so he's going to be here to kind of introduce himself and talk through his whole journey with FedEx from beginning to where he is today uh, and just help you really understand the the full picture, the full journey of what this can look like. So Marlon, if you want to go ahead and come on and say hello. Hello. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> hey, Marlon. Uh, so I'll kick it over to you if you just kind of want to introduce yourself and kind of talk through how you got into this space and, and what it's been like since then. Okay, no problem. Uh, so I can't, I became a FedEx contractor uh, October of 2020. Uh, so I've been doing it, you know, almost going on, you know, close to, you know, three and a half years now. Um, you know, I'm down in the uh, the Fort Myers, uh, Florida area. So obviously um, I bought a carve out um, when I came in. Uh, my prior experience prior to becoming a, a, a FedEx contractor was not in the logistics field. Um, I did 12 years in the U.S. Army, uh, military police, uh, got out, uh, had a career with the uh, sheriff's office in Georgia, uh, instructor, trainer, you know, worked various different things in that. So, um, you know, I had a, you know, attack for dealing with unique situations, which, you know, can kind of help uh, in, in this space. Um, but obviously, you know, coming on and and listen to a lot of the uh, the topics uh, that Route Consultant had, you know, prior to becoming a contractor, I kind of you know, engulf myself in, in learning and uh, just getting as much knowledge as I can um, before I came in there. And then I continued a learning learning curve, you know, as things went on and, you know, everything else was kind of, you know, you 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 learn by trial and error. Um, you know, obviously, um, you know, you know, did things that I learned from that, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done, did things that, you know, maybe I should have done differently. Um, but, um, you know, all in all, you know, starting as a brand new contractor, um, it was right after COVID hit. Um, so basically it was, it wasn't the, the upward push of all the packages. It was kind of the downward swing, but it was still pretty, um, pretty heavy. Um, so learning how to maneuver your business through that, you know, all I saw was, you know, the, 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 the packages, how they were before, you know, well, right after COVID, um, yeah. so like I said, since I wasn't in the, you know, in the mix of things prior to that, um, you know, learning how to, uh, hire and recruit drivers. Uh, that was one of my things. Um, having the trucks, you know, I had a fleet that was uh, a lot older. Um, I've structured that around differently to where um, I have about, you know, six uh, P1200s that are uh, 20, 20, I think 2021s and, you know, five other vehicles that are 2020. So I kind of went with a, a newer fleet, um, you know, bite the bullet and, you know, pay some payments on it versus deal with, you know, paying a lot of maintenance uh, because I did see, uh, coming in, I had a lot of maintenance costs. Uh, so that's one thing you definitely got to look at when you come in and that I learned from that, um, you know, I thought I took care of it when I came in, but, you know, you never know what things can hide as you become a contractor, just like buying 
any type of new car. You know, it works great when it goes off the lot, especially if it's used and yeah. drive it a few weeks and then your transmission falls out. So, uh, you know, that's, that's some things that, you know, you definitely have to look at and that I learned uh, based on trial, trial and error um, recruiting aspect, um, you know, hiring and retaining qualified drivers and, and just always having that, that stigma to, you know, always keep the best drivers that you can. I mean, if, if somebody falls off with, your expectations are, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, move on from those drivers, get rid of them, get new people in there. You know, a lot of times I see contractors keep keep drivers that are accident prone, uh, have issues with complaints and everything, just due to the fact that they don't have ability to get more drivers. And uh, I know certain markets are very different. I mean, I can only speak from uh, the market that I'm in down here, but I'm telling you, when you when you go on uh, Indeed and you put in, you know, your, uh, your hiring, I mean, literally I could get 30 applicants usually within a day and it just keeps piling on. Sometimes I have to turn it off within about three or four days because I'll have a hundred and some applicants. Now, not all of them are, are great candidates. So you got to kind of look through and I, I'm a firm believer if you apply for me and, you know, you don't put a resume up there to where I can kind of see what you've been doing. Um, I'm probably just going to skip past you and, and kind of keep looking. I've had pretty good luck at bringing on people that, you know, just had the, you know, one year of commercial driving, whether that was Uber or Lyft and and training them the way I wanted to train them and operate in this space um, versus just bringing people on that had prior experience. You know, I have done that before, but I have done that where, you know, you get some guy that wants to make all this money, but can't do 90 stops. And usually I'll see that within the first couple of days. That, yeah, you hyped yourself up, but you can't do it. You know, you talk to talk, but you can't walk the walk. Um, so I've seen that with, you know, growing through the business as far as uh, learning different, you know, contingency operations. Um, you know, I helped out, you know, FedEx and some of the uh, the DCA. So I was, you know, kind of not thrown into it, but, you know, dealing with some of the uh, the dedicated capacity agreements. And, you know, for some, some of you guys that might not know what that is, um, it's usually, you know, FedEx is kind of going away right now with a lot of the DCAs. I mean, they're, they're, they're putting a lot of the stuff on current contractors that are in the initial area uh, because obviously DCAs, you know, using cartage, which are third party um, vendors, you know, that costs a lot of money. So obviously if they can shift that to uh, contractors within the terminal, obviously that saves FedEx a lot of money. And also it, it puts more money in the contractor's pockets that are closer, but with that, you know, does come ramping up your organization, you know, extremely higher than what you normally have based on either somebody walking out or just somebody, um, you know, just, you know, usually it's walking out, but, you know, somebody just failing to a point where they need help. Um, so I, you know, I deployed up to, you know, you know, the Orlando and Tampa area. Um, I did that through peak about two years ago. Uh, obviously I came up there with a team. Um, nothing was set up. I mean, literally I had to come up there and I had to draw DRO out. I had to do my anchors from scratch that night uh, to be able to run the very next day. So obviously, um, you know, the way I run my business, you know, and, and certain people do it differently. Um, a lot of people, they, you know, they might put BCs and stuff like that, which I have the BCs and I kind of, you know, hit on that or what, what I have them do. Um, but I'm pretty much hands-on. I mean, I live here in the Fort Myers market um, and I'm at the terminal pretty much daily. Uh, Sometimes I even jump to the other terminal that I moved from, which is like literally closer to my house, about five minutes. And you know, mess with them sometime. And, you know, the senior manager still says you can't get rid of me. Um, <laughs> so basically, I, I do go there sometimes. So I know people in all three terminals. I mean, we have a select area down here in the Fort Myers market to where there's literally three FedEx terminals within, honestly, about 25 minutes of where I'm at. And there's three different terminals. So um, a lot of options. Uh, obviously, each one has their various different strengths. Um, and and kind of how I rolled into it, like I said, with doing the the, the DCA that caught me to kind of operate, you know, simultaneously in two different terminals that, you know, I was providing DCA in and not even in the current terminal. So I was able to go on and, you know, hire people, uh, quality people. Of course, when you come into DCA, uh, you always have the ability, you have current drivers in that terminal you're helping with. They always come over and try to talk to you. Uh, but, you know, I stood firm on the fact that, you know, I, I wasn't going to hire anybody that was in that terminal because 90% of the time, if you're coming there, you have the ability to pay more, but what you do, you, you make, you know, bad blood with other contractors because normally what do you do? You end up taking their drivers for that time frame, And then when you're out of there, 
you leave because you don't have any employment for them anymore. And, you know, they're struggling. So, you know, I, I kind of took it apart to bring people from my own team um, up there and uh, assist and then also hire people where I was actually looking on Indeed for currently badge contract or drop contract drivers who are not in this immediate area. Like I said, I, I can't help if they want to come from Atlanta or somewhere else. I mean, but uh, I didn't take anybody from the current. I kind of stuck with that. So obviously, you know, I did meet, meet a lot of contractors that I've met at uh, the expos over the last couple of years. Um, and, you know, like I said, I hope to still maybe, you know, be able to make the upcoming one uh, down in uh, Dallas this year. Um, but I have been to the last, you know, few, few in Vegas and, uh, you know, met a lot of contractors, uh, you know, throughout the time. I mean, some people I've never known before, but, you know, walk through uh, the airport and, you know, people are like calling my name and I'm thinking I owe them money or something like that. So, uh, <laughs> and that's kind of how, how a lot of that goes, but, Back to FedEx, you know, like I said, it was, it's been a great journey starting. Uh, you know, I jumped on and I, like I said, I hosted a couple of events with uh, Spencer back in October of 2020 when I came on. I came and hosted several other ones. Um, you know, being able to contingency plan in this market or actually in this uh, business in general is is very um, viable because stuff happens. And I, I can actually relate to some that's actually happening right now here and. I'll get into that as we, you know, I'm trying to put, do a full picture over there. Uh, but with this market, obviously, you know, we uh, we went through Hurricane Ian down here in uh, Fort Myers. I mean, it totally devastated it. I mean, like I said, I've been deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan and stuff like that. And I'll tell you, you know, getting up, driving through and looking at, you know, some of these neighborhoods that, you know, were just totally demolished by, you know, this hurricane with, you know, 140 mile per hour sustained winds where it ripped it ripped roofs off and tore trees up out the roofs and, and, and everything. Um, you know, a lot of people have dealt with terminals that, you know, stop running, you know, for a day or so due to, due to weather. Uh, we were at about four days. Um, and usually that's kind of unheard of in the FedEx market. You usually don't have terminals stop for four days. And then all of a sudden you get hit with, you know, peak times 10 with packages. And sometimes businesses aren't even open. So, you know, FedEx definitely stood by and, 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 you know, like I said, they came through, um, they, they provided, you know, food, they provided showers, they provided even gasoline, you know, they made the contractors pay for the gasoline. We weren't going to get that free, but drivers, um, and, you know, loaders, uh, they allowed them to come through once a day and actually fill up their, their vehicles, uh, with a badge. So, you know, they actually looked out because the fuel lines, I mean, they were ridiculous. I mean, you know, it, you, you would think that it was a massive shortage to where, just go into the gas station. I mean, you have to try to hit it maybe at 2 a.m. and it still might be a line wrapped around the block um, until they run out of fuel. Um, so pretty much, um, you know, dealing with that, moving into peak, um, dealing with FedEx. Obviously, uh, we had a stint where, you know, a contractor, for whatever reasons, you know, he he walked out um, and, you know, kind of had to jump in and, and say I kind of had to, but you know, obviously the, the volume was there. So usually I don't get on the truck, but, you know, I found myself for almost three weeks on a route every day. And that sucked, you know, especially trying to, you know, run the operations of the business and yet still also come around and, you know, try to manage things. Um, that's where you bring in your managers and stuff like that. Um, and I've had a you know good relationship. I've had several employees has been with me for almost the whole time that I've owned the company. I've had some that have came and gone. Uh, you know, obviously I don't I don't hold no ill will for people who want to go to greener pastures. I mean, I will say that like always, you know, the grass is not always greener on the other side. They tend to come back. And usually if they left on good terms and everything like that, gave me, you know, good notice. We agreed on a good parting term. Uh, you know, I'll bring them back. Uh, some, no, I won't bring them back. And, you know, they beg and ask and I just won't bring them back. Um, but that kind of runs up to everything, you know, kind of leading up even till till now. I mean, we went through overlap and the overlap when I bought, I was a, a ground only contractor. So uh, for some people who don't know the difference, you know, uh, we used to have home delivery only contractors. We used to have ground that dealt with commercial volume. Um, it was a five day. It was great. Uh, but it, it, it kind of sucked during peak because as a ground only contractor, you don't get the influx in home delivery uh, like you would, you know, if you were, you know, home delivery dealing with, um, you know, basically uh, residential stuff. So I was able to kind of switch my business around. The area that I'm currently in now um, is not the actual area that I bought into FedEx. Um, 
I was able to, you know, do some willing and dealing and, you know, buy, sell, buy, sell. And now I'm completely overlapped um, with FedEx. Uh, and that just means I have all my ground and home delivery volume wrapped into one. Um, they've, they've also did the overlap process where they relocated me from one terminal to another terminal, which that terminal is actually about two minutes from my actually delivery area. So, you know, basically with that, I have some real tight uh, density routes um, that a couple of them, you know, actually mostly all of them. Um, I don't think each truck puts more than 30, 35 miles uh, a day on the truck. So when you think about investing in a sixty, seventy thousand dollars truck, you know, yeah, you, you could probably make a little more money going further in those stem miles, but you're going to put some wear and tear on those trucks to where, you know, no matter how you can say, hey, your service charge is more and all this, nothing can equal having to replace a truck faster than the other person. You, you're driving an hour and a half, your drivers are going an hour and a half, and my drivers are going three minutes down the road, and it might take four years for me to hit, you know, 30,000 miles, and you can hit 60,000 in one year. So, I mean, the way you look at it is still, you know, uh, the nuts and bolts, you know, you can still be a lot more profitable having that that low density, but you also can be profitable having further further uh, routes also. It's just a unique recruiting method because the way the drivers will look at, hey, you pay this, this amount and hey, I pay this amount. Generally, everybody's paying the same somewhat, but this guy's got to drive an hour and a half to his first stop, deliver, drive an hour and a half back. My, they drive five minutes to their first stop, deliver five minutes back to the terminal, and, and you got just less time. So that does help also uh, having routes that are close and uh, uh, low stem miles. You know, that's definitely an add on recruit uh, recruiting process. But, um, you know, some of the things we're going through even right now uh, with contingency locally, um, our actual mall here that I have, I have a mall that's in my area. Uh, it had a main water main break uh, yesterday. So the entire mall was shut down. Uh, they had about two feet of water in the mall and was shut down yesterday. It was shut down all day today. Uh, they don't even know if it's going to open tomorrow, but that right there, um, you know, you got to work on some, you know, different plannings with the station, uh, kind of set up routes to where they're on a load and they know it's not going out. And I know it's not going out, but I have to be ready to move once the mall opens, you know, they'll give me a little time to do it, but they're not going to let me mess around for a week and just have volume sitting there. And I don't want it because like I said, some of this stuff, you know, with, with my mall routes, I mean, after two days, you know, I, I could use a 54 foot trailer to take some of that stuff. That's just how bulky it gets. Um, so obviously, uh, you know, I do get some of the express. I know we kind of talk into the express, um, you know, merger and stuff like that. And obviously, you know, most people probably know that June 1st, you know, it's going to happen uh, as far as the express merger with, uh, you know, the FedEx ground network. Uh, but that doesn't mean you're just going to get dropped on the express. You know, they don't even have a time frame when I'm going to get it. Uh, but I will say I am running express volume. Uh, I don't have any time commits or anything like that on my stuff. Uh, basically, it's, it comes to my truck. It's extra packages. Um, you know, I'm probably getting about 200 to 250 extra stops a day. Uh, they're smaller. I mean, but I have seen some 100 pound ICs come to express too. So, you know, I look on there and like, who shipped this from Denver? But, <laughs> you know, they, you know they're, they're shipping golf. I mean, like I said, down here, um, you know, the weather's warm. Um, you know, it's probably mid 90s right now. I mean, you look at January, February, it was high 80s. Uh, people come down here to golf all the time. Um, and like I said, they're they're shipping their golf bags more than they, they ship them on the flight. Um, so they ship that stuff express. And like I said, we're getting it. So obviously, you know, with the express merger coming, once it does hit, you know, there's going to be added stuff we're going to have to do. I think right now we're in the um, the time frame of kind of, you know, changing the decals as they come in on the trucks, you know, uh, operated by uh, Federal Express Corporation for uh, the DOT things. And obviously everything else is kind of going to fall into there. Uh, but the initial merger, you know, I think they do have that slated for around one June or so. Uh, but, you know, for the most part, you know, it's still going to be a time frame. Uh, for some of that other stuff uh, once it comes in. So, um, I mean, that's, that kind of takes a full circle. I don't know if I missed anything or, you know. Oh, I think yeah, I think that that kind of covers everything. And and I'm going to have more questions for you later. I'm sure other people okay. will, will will make sure to to get it all. But, you know, where where does that leave you now? Where where are you today? Uh, pretty much at this point, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at the, the downward end of my thing. Uh, obviously, 
Uh, I'm at the process of actually, uh, you know, selling. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, my uh, my operation is going to be listed with Route Consult and it's currently listed with Route Consult. So, uh, you know, definitely if anybody uh, is interested in it, make sure you reach out uh, to Josh them and, you know, they can definitely uh, take you up and, you know, show you the you know intimate details on it. Um, just going into some of the stuff on it, you know, I'll be listening. It's going to be listed for about 1.2 million. Um, obviously has a multiple about 4.65 and that's about 90% of revenue. Um, currently I'm running about 11 employees. I have uh, two managers. I've owned it for three years. And like I said, my owner involvement with it is, uh, is daily. Uh, obviously that can be tweaked. Um, like I said, I do have right now currently working for me as drivers. I have three drivers that used to be former contractors, BCs, um, they're drivers for me. So like I said, they have the ability to do it, but I don't, I don't let go of the reins that easy. So uh, I can do, I can't allow them to do it, but I still do my DRO daily. They don't touch it. So like I said, they, they can look at my DSW, but they don't touch my DRO. So I know how to do it. I handle it every day. Um, you know, I've, 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 I've let somebody, you know, touch it one time and, you know, they felt sorry for the drivers that, you know, I was giving them so many stops and they right. spread it out. And then I started seeing I was losing some money. So I took it back again. But, you know, generally in this area, I mean, like I said, I have at least a couple drivers within my operation just because it's so dense. I mean, they're hitting 265, 280 stops a day and they're finishing before five o'clock. So when you look at that and having drivers that, you know, you pay them well, they're going to perform well. And as long as you make a profitable standpoint, you can you can come out ahead. So obviously with the trucks, uh, it's about 11 trucks that, that that's included in the sale. Obviously, I have more, uh, but I'm going to be utilizing uh, my extra uh, transits that are not located in the sale. I'll be using them for uh, a venture getting out. And obviously, I know, you know, a lot of people might have that question. Why are you leaving? You know, so obviously you have the good and the bad. Obviously the bad, you know, like I said, I, I kind of felt that, you know, the daily involvement with FedEx um, that I feel to maintain a successful organization, you know, I feel that I need to be involved with it daily just to know what's going on and, and you know, always be accustomed to what's going on. Not saying in this operation, you have to do it. Is structure um, very important? Yes, because obviously if you're going to walk away and, and kind of be an absentee owner, you need to make sure you have the right management structure in place so you can do that. And you can do that with structurary different. And I can do that too, but just, I can't let myself do that. That's why I don't do it. But obviously, you know, I'll be walking away to probably, you know, go into another logistics, uh, you know, you know, venture outside to where, you know, I'll be creating my own company and doing some shipping and stuff like that, you know, outside of it to where, you know, it's more, I won't say the the realm or, you know, the the rails are a little more relaxed, but it is because, you know, owning your own business and not having big brother looking over is very different. So that's one of the reasons that, you know, I'm kind of, you know, just looking to merge out. I mean, like I said, it's definitely not a fire sale. And like I said, it's one of those things that, like I said, the first ones that I, I reached out to to kind of list it was Route Consult. Like I said, I bought from Route Consult. Um, and now, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm putting it back on the market and, you know, I'm very transparent with everything. And I do, you know, envision anyone that's interested, definitely reach out. And, you know, even if they wanted to come down, I've had people uh, throughout the years, you know, they've literally came down and talked to me and I showed them my operation, just I wasn't selling it at that point, but they came down, they saw how it ran, I badged them. They even went out, I've had a couple prospective people went out with some of my drivers and just like, man, I don't know how they do it, but, uh, <laughs> but they've actually done that. So like I said, I'm definitely, you know, open for that. And like I said, I'll just pass it to, to Josh. And like I said, you know, anybody have any questions with my listings or anything like that? definitely reach out to them. I'm, I'm open, uh, but it does have to kind of run through route consultant. Like I said, we can answer, you know, some of the stuff, but you know, some of the more pertinent stuff probably definitely have to be addressed offline probably. Yeah. And it, you know, I think you've talked about it. If somebody were to, to purchase from you, would it be something where you provide any support for somebody afterwards? Yeah. I was looking, you know, to, to make sure you're, uh, I guess, successful in it. You know, I live here in Fort Myers. I'm not going anywhere. You know, if you needed me for a couple of months, great. If you needed me, I ain't trying to be on for a year now, but, you know, in, in an operational sense, I can definitely say within the thing, I would definitely be willing to stay on, uh, you know, for, for a short amount of time to make sure you're successful, to make sure you know the ins and outs that you can deal with the terminal. Um, I will say the terminal is one of those terminals that they're by the book. I mean, when, when I speak with my terminal, there's only four contractors in the building. Now, when you talk about expanding uh, this network, you know, you look at what's called scale guidelines. Uh, when you look at scale guidelines, you know, that's the, the amount that you can grow 
believe it or not, the scale guidelines for our building is 100%. Now, some people, they, they go, wow, what does that mean? Well, basically, the way they have that set with the four contractors, there's two big contractors and there's two smaller contractors. So I have about, I'm about 47% of the building. Um, then another contractor, he's right around the same. And then we have two other small ones that are like 7%. So one contractor could probably buy those other two smaller ones. And then it would just be three, even though they say a hundred percent, they're kind of, they're kind of worried to let one contractor buy a hundred percent of the building, just because it, it's a lot of moving parts. And literally by looking at DRO at night and looking at the packages, if one person was to buy a hundred percent of the building, I mean, he would probably be dealing with closely 8,000 packages and probably close to 6,000 stops a day uh, in that one building. And you probably need like six or seven managers. So that is a huge overtaking and I wouldn't even want to do that. But uh, mm -hmm. the thing is there is opportunities and like I say, definitely you can reach out to Ralph Consultant. And if, you know, if it's something that you want to move on with this and, you know, expand, I, I definitely can probably point Ralph Consultant to talk to some other contractors that are uh, open to sell. I mean, when you're coming into this market, um, you know, you may not see something that's listed, but guess what? If you take time to reach out to a terminal, show up, you know, I've seen people literally walk to the terminal and ask, you know, if they're going to buy it. And then the terminal like gives them to me. And then the guy doesn't have any money. And it's just like, why are you guys sending this person to me? And they're like, well, you're selling. Like I said, I, I chose to do it this way. Um, Obviously, like I said, you know, we get people that, you know, they post stuff for whatever reasons. And, you know, a lot of times we see it on Facebook where, you know, they're anonymous, you know, the the the, the anonymous person. Um, but for me, it's fully transparent. I mean, the terminal, I told them exactly when I even listed some of the stuff before. If I could tag the terminal manager, I would tag the terminal manager. I tell her, if you find anybody that want to buy, send them to me. So they're 100% open with that. I mean, there's there's no need to not do it. I mean, because like I said, as soon as I could be walking by and I hear somebody talking about, you know, uh, you know, somebody looking to buy and I, I turn around, it's like, you know, like a, like an eagle, you know, I'm trying to figure out who, who, who's looking to buy something, but I'm definitely saying whether it's my operation or any operation, if you have your mindset on it, whether it's, you know, Fort Myers, Miami, you know, anything like that, you know, if the price is right, somebody will sell and you just got to be able to structure that deal and, and, and connect with somebody. And obviously, you know, route consultant, whether it was something listed through there or not, you could still reach out to them and, they can act as your agent to even, you know, coordinate buying a thing from you, uh, you know, both as a buyer and a seller. So. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. So like I said, we're going to get to more questions for you in a little bit, Marlon. So I, I really appreciate you kind of walking through that story. And for everyone who has more questions, feel free to type them in. I've already seen some come up in the chat. And so we'll get to those in just a second. Uh, and I'll go through all some more Q and A. It'll be completely open. So as I'm going through these next couple of things. If you have anything that you want to ask Marlon or me about anything in the space, you can go ahead and start typing those in. So uh, there are a, a few additional listings that have come live this week to just highlight quickly. Uh, first one is out of Florida. So this is uh, another another one in the area. Actually, this is this is the one that we were just talking about here. Uh, the the 1.2, this is Marlon. So that one is live. So if you have questions on that, we'll, like like Marlon said, reach out to us. Uh, we've got another one that's a line haul business out of California. Uh, it's at 950,000. Uh, this one has five dedicated solo runs and, and a spare tractor. Um, and so if you're looking for something in Southern California and having, and trying to get into the line haul space, um, that's a, that's a good one that just came live for you. Uh, the next three, actually the last three for today are all Amazon listings. So we've got one that's out of Arizona. Uh, it's 28 Amazon routes for $821,000. This one has four managers, 10 spare trucks, and actually seven owned vehicles. Um, this, you know, you don't always see owned vehicles on the Amazon, Amazon side because it is a lease program, but this one does come with seven owned vehicles as well. Uh, next one is out of Pennsylvania. It's 25 routes at $550,000. Um, and so again, this is one where if you're in that area, it's a great opportunity. Uh, and then the last one is out of New York. So it, this is a, a larger Amazon business, 45 routes at 1.9 million. Uh, this is a, a really high performing Amazon business, really large, multiple managers, and has uh, they've consistently performed in the, the fantastic rating, where if you understand kind of how the Amazon works, that means they consistently are getting the, the bonus profitability for running a really successful organization. So 
Uh, if you're looking for any of those for, on the Amazon side, Arizona, Pennsylvania, and New York, we've got those three that just came live. Now, a uh, couple of other events to just quickly highlight. One, uh, we do have happy hours across the country. We actually had one in St. Louis uh, just last night. Uh, and we have one coming up in LA next month as well. So we have that full schedule on our website. If you're looking for uh, any of those across the country, they're completely free to attend. So if we're coming in your neck of the woods, you can come out and meet us, meet other contractors and other prospective buyers in the area. Uh, and like I said, those are always free. We always provide the food and the drinks so you can have a good time too. Uh, and then coming up in July, we have the X or sorry, the first week of August is our large expo. Uh, Marlon mentioned it. We have it every year that is designed as a uh, a way for us all contractors across the country to come together have a great time uh you know free food free alcohol uh entertainment and also it more than that it's also a place for us all to come together talk about the way the industry is changing learn from each other meet vendors uh, from basically all the vendors you can ever imagine in this space all in one place and and it is in Dallas this year, the first week of August. So uh, free to attend, free to register, but those hotel rooms are continuing to fill up. So if you are trying to book, if you are trying to attend that that expo, I would encourage you to go ahead and book a hotel room because uh, there we have limited pricing on, on uh, the block that we have reserved for that hotel. Uh, only other event I'll mention is we have an ongoing, we have new investor summits that happen uh, on a reoccurring basis. And our next one is actually uh, next uh, Thursday, March 28th. So if you're looking to learn more about the space and trying to really get a sense for if this is the right fit for you, we have a workshop at our office in Nashville. Uh, if you want to attend, just go to our website and you can register. Uh, and like I said, it's in our office in Nashville. It's a good place for you to come learn and really solidify if it's the right space for you. Meet our team, meet some experts, and, and again, uh, get that free food and, and entertainment so that you can really, but the goal of it is really to help you decide if FedEx is the right space for you. And if you're on the fence between P&D and line hall, it's another good way to decide which one's the right fit. So uh, that's what I wanted to cover. So now we're gonna get to Q and A. Uh, and so uh, one I have for you really quick, Marlon is, um, you know, you've done P&D this whole time. Did you ever think about line haul? Did you ever kind of have that that decision and, and what what kind of caused you to stick with P&D? Well, yeah, I, I applied for, I never tried to purchase any of line haul. Obviously that is probably the easier way to get in. Uh, just do the fact that some people that are not, you know, too familiar with line haul, you know, you got to have at least two runs to get in. So when you see that one run and you try to eye that and you're not already a line haul, that ain't going to help you. So I, I saw a couple that actually posted in my my my, my own terminal, but you know I think they still kind of go with the safe space versus you know going out on the the you know the realm of bringing people in. Like I said, I succeeded you know as a P and D contractor. Obviously, I I did an AIM meeting and I I actually got an AIM meeting, which is the meeting with the senior manager, uh, you know, for a line hall one, and it it was something that they were trying to bring up right before peak. And like I said, they posted in July. I got the AIM meeting in October. I don't know why they waited that long, but uh -huh. we go through the A meeting and and some of the questions that were asked, um, you know, I just had to be brutally honest with the terminal manager because he was like, well, uh, have you set up, you know, I, I know you run your day-to-day -day business and the PD yourself. How are you going to do the line haul? Because, you know, you, you can't do both like that. And I was like, well, I'll try and I'll bring on somebody that I can, I can trust to help me. And for, next question goes, uh, you know, who, who do you have slotted for your BC? And I'm like, are you giving me the runs? And he <laughs> looked at me. I'm like, why would I hire a BC or a manager if I don't have it yet? So no, I haven't hired a BC. So we yeah. kind of, like, you know, when are you guys looking to start this up? And well, uh, as, soon as, pop, as, as soon as possible, we, we want somebody to be ready by peak. I'm like, it's October now. It's, I was like, there, yeah. <laughs> there's no way I can start this up in three weeks. You know, literally I hadn't, I mean, I could go out and resource some trucks. I can go try to hire, but you know, you you need some time on that. So I think the way that was kind of structured, especially with that, that was almost going to be structured for somebody that was already in line hall. And 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 like I said, where I'm seeing a lot, uh, it looks like there is a lot of you know internal, you know, not internal growth, but growth, uh, you know, geographically wise for line hall. Because like I said, you do have a leg up. You know, you can 
you can run that trip to to purchase it and and kind of go in that way, which probably be the easiest way. Um, but like I said, you find an area where, you know, you sometimes see, you know, 10 runs and stuff like that set up, um, you know, in some areas, you know, I saw those. I was kind of, you know, kind of taken back because most of those 10 runs were 10 team runs. And I definitely didn't want to jump into the, the arena with team runs. And for some people that might not understand what team runs are, you know, you got to have two people there. So not only are you hiring one driver, you got to hire two to three, four drivers. And then you got to find the drivers that like getting along with somebody who they might not like to deal with. So that was definitely not something I wanted to do. Uh, so, I mean, I, I, I tossed it in there, but after, you know, the kind of let down and the questions they asked me in the A meeting for that, I kind of just said, you know what, I'll stick to the P and D. I, I have went on build a ground biz and I'll say some people that haven't done that. And, you know, that's not taking any business away from route consultant. Cause when you go on build a ground biz and, you, you do that, that's a whole nother thing. And like I said, usually those are dumpster fires and usually FedEx, you know, they're, they're giving you a contract that's not the best and they want you to start up instantly and run something. So, you know, I would definitely urge that, you know, if you could pay a, a decent price for a, a well-planned route and that's your first acquisition, you probably would want to do that probably before taking something free because everything's free is not all good money. Easy money is not always good money, so... Yeah, and, and I think what you're highlighting there, it is one of the hardest things about Lime Hall is that getting that first step, you know, whether it's it's getting something internally or something from Builder Ground Biz or buying it. Lime Hall is, I found that there's just fewer opportunities to get into this space because there's fewer contractors. And so finding the right one just might take a little bit longer. Um, uh, and, and it's always exciting when, you know, they post something in July uh, and then it takes, you know, three months after that for them to decide to interview you. And then they decide to try to make you hurry up. <laughs> um, now, you mentioned the interview there. So uh, a question here from uh, from one of the attendees, basically, you know, any tips that you would have for someone who's going into an interview with a, a terminal manager, um, like anything that you would tell people to think about, to be able to answer or prepare for in that interview? Uh, yeah, actually, what is my video? It doesn't come on now. I don't know what happened with that. Can you see me? Uh, not right now, but I can hear you. Okay. Well, I don't know. It's not coming on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I would I would say, you know, the best thing for coming in the interview uh, would probably be to reach out to obviously you guys. I mean, you guys can structure a lot of the um, the questions that, that might answer. Obviously, uh, you know, just tips from the trade of what other contractors have went through. Uh, basically, they're they're gonna they're gonna ask you to come in there and be able to talk. I mean, you know, I'm not saying a, a you know I used to be a you know recruiter, so obviously the gift to gab is you know definitely one thing that you can you can sell yourself a lot on there. I mean, they're gonna ask some questions. They're gonna you know uh, you know they're they're gonna try to lean on to for you to give them as much information as you want, but. You know, obviously, you know, you want to be truthful with them. I mean, if they're going to ask questions of, you know, what is your plan of uh, ownership? Obviously, do you plan to be here daily? And you say, yeah, I'm going to be here daily, but you have no plans to remove him from where you are. Uh, then that's that's just something that you got to kind of, there I am. Uh, I didn't even do anything. Uh, but, you know, that's just one of the things that you have to kind of look at. Um, so basically, you know, just being able to um, kind of just reach out. Obviously, you guys have, you know, sent a lot of people and I think you guys do have a program you know, for preparing people for, for the AIM meeting. But like I said, I've been through, I've been through three or four of them. Uh, like I said, just conversations. Um, a lot of them were the free stuff. And like I said, most of the time it's me on build a ground biz, just looking, saying, Hey, let me think that I don't really want this, but let me, let me put it in for her. And guess what? I get an AIM meeting for it. So, you know, the stuff that I really want, I don't get no AIM meeting for it, but then the stuff that I'm like, ah, let me see this. And then they call me, I'm like, ah, something's wrong with this. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, I, just talking. I mean, the questions are are simple. You know, you you do a RFI, uh, which is a request for information. Uh, they have a format for that. You're just going to lay out your business, a little bit about you, how you're going to, you know, head off safety. Safety is a big thing for FedEx. You know, how you're going to, you know, train and, and and recruit and plan for contingency and and things of that nature. So, like I said, they're going to ask the questions. I mean, you know, they're they're looking for. I mean, it's more like a, I mean, it's basically is like a job interview because, you know, you can, you can be structured, set up to, to purchase a route, but guess what? If you go in there and you take that aim meeting, it's open. I mean, there, there's nothing that can help after that. And like I said, there, that's no, no big worries, but you know, there's some people that they, they're not people, people, uh, they're not people, persons, they can't talk. 
And, you know, that's just something you just have to really, really prepare yourself if, if you're trying to come into this space, because you will have to go in front of a probably a senior manager, a P&D manager. And definitely, usually they have BDS, uh, which is business development. Uh, you know, they're kind of the link between you and, you know, basically FedEx, maybe when you can get a hold of them. But uh, <laughs> but usually they're tough to get a hold of. Uh, and I think any current contractor can probably, you know, relate to that. Uh, but basically, um, you know, if you do have that, you know, you should be pretty set. It, it's not too tired. I would not stress too much about it, you know, but like I said, you definitely need to be able to talk out your plan, talk out safety, you know, talk out, you know, how you're going to be able to run this because in, in actuality, um, they're going to be putting a lot of, uh, you know, trusting you for, you know, you not to come in and just drop the ball, you know, day one, when you decided, oh, it might be too much, you know, they want to make sure you have that. And that's kind of also where I said with my, my location, I wouldn't, I wouldn't allow that because like I said, even though I, I might be out and, you know, whatnot, I still would, you know, I, I feel bad. It wouldn't sit right with me for, you know, not being able to help somebody, you know, do stuff. And I've helped contractors that, you know, I had no ties to, you know, I've came and assisted them with their DRO came out, you know, if they're close in Florida help them with their day-to-day their -day stuff, you know, because sometimes they, they have a good plan, but they just don't have a good delivery method. And, you know, sometimes they don't want to be the bad guy to their employees. So I was like, well, I'll come be the bad guy. And uh, you can tell them I said it. So, you know, it kind of works that way. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, all that's right. And I think the other thing too, is if you know the, the seller, I would ask them, you know, to tell you a little bit about the personality of that terminal manager, just to kind of know, what you're walking into, like what you can expect from that uh, and get those tips. And, you know, in general, you're going to need to know things like, you know, how you plan to handle safety, how you plan to handle recruiting. There's some things around the contract you should have reviewed and understand around, you know, insurance, indemnification, basically how are you getting paid and what are you held liable for? So reviewing the contract's important. And then in general, everything that you've put into that RFI that you've submitted before the interview, uh, be able to talk to it and assume that they haven't read it. Uh, hopefully they have read your RFI, but assume they haven't and be able to talk to anything that you wrote down. Yeah. And I, I'll actually caveat, I mean, for, for those that are current contractors applying for other areas where you have yeah. to submit, make sure, I mean, like I said, you know, as law enforcement, I've always, you know, when I did an interview, I've already did my investigation on you. I know the questions, <laughs> I know the answers to the questions you should be giving me, but I, I can tell if you're trying to, you know, you know, not be truthful. Trust me, they've already done their background on you. I mean, I've 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 did an AIM meeting and they they reached out and said, hey, your your safety's been pretty good. You haven't had that many complaints. I mean, this is a terminal that states away. They have access to that, you know, and they'll they'll also just like any business, they'll reach out. You know, if if, if Josh is a terminal manager down in in Florida and I'm in California and I call and say, hey, this guy, he's a PND uh, contractor. You know, he's applied to how, how is he, you know, they're not going to tell you offline or you know, face to face what they talk about. But, you know, I have had my terminal manager said, hey, you're, you're applying for this, aren't you? And I'm like, yeah, he's like, yeah, they reached out to me. I was like, oh, you tell him not to do anything. He's just last <laughs> way. But, you know, like I said, I have no problem. Sometime in my RFI, I'll actually list, you know, uh, reach out to my current terminal manager and I'll put his phone number down because, you know, that's 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 good in FedEx, because if you have another terminal manager that's going to say, hey, this guy knows what he's doing, you know, he, he could be an asset, you know, moving up. That helps a lot. And that can go a lot of ways because, you know, some of these people, they don't know you. I mean, they have no clue who you are. Um, they just know you're coming in to buy something. So they definitely want to make sure. So you do have a leg up a little bit coming in as a contractor versus coming in, you know, uh, not being a contractor, because, you know, some of these areas, you know, you know, some station managers they're scared to, you know, release some of those responsibilities to a, a new person because it affects them. I mean, you come in and start failing. I mean, that affects them. I don't know if it affects your bonuses or nothing, but it can really affect, affect them if their terminal starts crashing and burning uh, based on a, a decision they made to bring on a new contractor. Yeah. And, and that does impact things, especially as you get closer to peak season, because they definitely get bonused on how the terminal performs during peak and so it's that's why the closer you get to peak, the the more hesitant they are and the more prepared you should be uh, in that interview. But right now is a good time of year for interviewing. You know, there's still plenty of time. Peak planning hasn't even really started yet. So uh, lots of time there. And, and that shouldn't be a factor, but um, it's just a general concern. The closer you get, the more you think about it. Now, we both, you know, I mentioned safety and, and you have as well. 
a question here in the 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 Q and A is uh, how did you go about setting up your own safety policy when you started? Um, well, actually, I, I think when I first set up, I think I actually uh, spoke to Rockets on that. Kind of got some information from you guys and kind of looked at it and you know kind of tweaked things around as far as you know uh, you know the common uh, you know what's commonly needed. Uh, I reached out to the contractor that I was purchasing for, uh, for purchasing from, kind of seeing, hey, what he might have. And then I kind of added my own thing in there. I mean, obviously, you know, you can never be too safety conscious. Uh, like I said, nobody wants to have to go tell, you know, a driver's family member that he didn't make it home, you know, tonight based on, you know, even even the fact that you put everything in place for him to do, but he didn't do. I mean, at, at that point, you did do everything you needed, but obviously it still affects your business. I mean, um, and, and like I said, you know, obviously me speaking from that, you know, uh, probably what brand new as a contractor, I can say I had an event happen within my company that, you know, probably most can probably say they never had happened. Um, I had a driver that, you know, it's, it's done and over with, it's already been litigated and everything like that. But I had a driver that was, uh, you know, had a seatbelt on, but he was texting and driving and there was a moped in front of him. And basically Moped was doing 40 miles an hour on a on a pretty much a, a 50 mile per hour street. Well, driver was doing 50 and ran him over. Uh, you know, it was a fatality. Uh, so I had that happen within my uh, operation. Obviously, being in law enforcement, I kind of seen that. But obviously, you don't you don't want to have that happen everywhere. You don't want to know that you know your business, your driver responsible for you know somebody else's. And obviously, you know the way FedEx did have it, you know handle it. You know, I will say on the back end, um, they did come through. They did handle all the litigation charges. Uh, they did handle, you know, everything dealing with the, uh, the payouts to the family. Uh, obviously the driver did get, uh, you know, he got cited, uh, he didn't get charged, but he had, he had, you know, a year of probation and stuff like that. So there was no jail time with it. Uh, because I think some of it involved, uh, you know, the moped operating on a, a road that they shouldn't be operating on and some stuff like that. Um, but like I said, in actuality, you know, did his, uh, inattentiveness, you know, result in a fatality? Yes, because it was it was shown on the vetter. I mean, obviously those coming in, you know, the the vehicle cameras that show outward facing and inward facing, um, you know, it was able to be uh, pulled up uh, and basically you can, you can see him, you know, texting and, you know, he admitted to doing it. I mean, it was nothing, you know, he lied about, but I did have that within my business. And like I said, I did, you know, right at this point, you know, I do have uh, a trend very highly on safety, um, I can say probably since I've been a current contractor in the last three and a half years, I probably only had five accidents in three and a half years. Uh, and like I said, you know, some look at like, man, how is your safety so low? And, you know, quote unquote, your guy was involved in a fatality. Well, it's about occurrences. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, it, it, it sounds crazy, but guess what? FedEx will look worse on the fact that I might have had one fatality in two years versus you having five in one year. I mean, they, they actually would look more favorably on me than they would you because obviously, you know, I, the, it's, it's the occurrence. I mean, it's it's lower. Yeah, I mean, and frequency breeds severity. So, you know, accidents happen. Everybody understands that. But if they're seeing, even if they're minor incidents, a lot of them, that just opens up the uh, the door and the, it, it leads to kind of the idea that you're, there's probably something lax in your safety strategy that is that's opening up the door for more severe accidents to happen. So you're you're right. It is about occurrences, um, and you know FedEx protects you litigation and, and liability side, but it's definitely important to have both uh, an upfront safety strategy and to kind of enforce it and train on it throughout the year and have your, you know, vetter, your your safety meetings, whatever it is that you do on an ongoing basis to help make sure that that remains a priority. Um, so just as a, a last question that came in, somebody probably heard you kind of mention it and just wanted to, to understand again, you know, you're getting out after three and a half years. What's kind of your rationale, your reason for, for retiring from FedEx? Uh, pretty much, like I said, it, it's it's a day to day involvement. I mean, it, it. I will say it's a lot. I mean, it's a lot to run it that way. Um, obviously, yeah. Could I scale it down and you know give my uh, BCs more control and do things? Yeah, I could do that. But like I said, me, I feel it's my business. I mean, I'm 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 at the head of it every day. You know, like I said, some people they feel more comfortable, but I tell you what, I mean, I could probably count on one hand only even even when I go to. You know, when I went to the route consultant things, I mean, you should see me. I'm on my phone. I'm checking ground cloud. I'm, 
I'm, right, I'm doing plenty. I mean, I'm glad we were in central time, central time zone this time because that Vegas stuff last year it killed me because we had that and then turned around and had the uh, the FedEx uh, conference right after that. Oh, yeah. you know, yeah. I felt bad for the people on the West Coast because I was the East Coast part, so we had a break. I mean, those guys probably came over and they're looking like zombies that Monday because literally, you know, they're they're tore up from route consulting that week and then they went straight into FedEx. So, um, you know, like I said, basically, you know, that that has changed a little bit. So, I mean, I, w- I would just say, you know, the rationale for me getting out is obviously just to, to wind down. Obviously, uh, you know, FedEx, you know, has allowed to, you know, prosper and, you know, make money in this space. But obviously, you know, just the day to day going 100 percent for me is one of those things for me to just back down, you know, open it up, let somebody else, you know, share the fruits of the work, you know, the wealth. And and like I said, the, the team that I have, I mean, because that was one thing that, you know, obviously we're doing this. I don't think uh, we, you know, Rock Consultants ever done it before where they allowed, uh, you know, somebody that was exiting the space, you know, actually, you know, put a put a name, put a face to their operation and say that, you know, this is mine and, you know, I'll take full responsibility of it. But um a lot of questions you have is, you know, what about your drivers? Well, like I tell you, you know, they're there. I mean, and they know if I get a buyer, I'm selling. So there ain't no issue. But the only thing I can tell a new buyer, if, if they're not looking to change, and this is with anybody mostly, I mean, yeah. because they have they have families, they have mortgages, they have, uh, you know, they have to live. If you're not messing with their paycheck, they come to work every day. And that's just simple as it is. I mean, I got drivers that, oh, I know if I paid less money, they'd be gone. But I pay them a good wage. And like I said, obviously with FedEx, you know, there's there's trial and error, error every year because obviously inflation just doesn't cut, catch up with our contract. It just doesn't. And down here in, in the Florida market, I will tell you, you know, two bedroom apartments are going for like twenty one hundred dollars a month. I mean, they're very expensive. So um, that's the biggest thing to why I don't have an issue usually with you know, with telling that, because like I said, a employees are going to come and go. And that's what I'm saying. You know, I'll be sticking by to, 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 to walk a new owner through and how to do things. Obviously it'll be up to them and how much they want to shave on the pay. I mean, it's completely up to you, but I will say changing that, you know, that's one thing that before you change that, you, you, you know, before you pull the trigger, you need to have some bullets in there because <laughs> if people are quitting, you're going to be hurting and you need to make sure you have people in the shoot ready to train, ready to put in there. But you know, you, you know, it's easier to retain people, pay them a little more than to have the constant revolving door of people. Because what you're doing, I mean, I, it sucks even now. I mean, with the weight that we're getting now, um, we're I'm bringing in drivers even now and they're not making it. You know, I, I don't put them on the light route. When I train new drivers, I put them on my heaviest route and I actually incentivize my drivers. I give them 75 bucks if they can make them quit in the first day. And they <laughs> they kill me on it because they give them the stairs. They give them the, the uh, sixties. And like I said, it's one of those things that I want to know if you're going to crack under pressure. And, and like I said, if you can't do the hard route, I don't, I honestly, I'll keep bringing somebody in. And I, I got some, like I said, I got some beasts on me right now. And like I said, I, I put some new people on there. And the first thing they say is, Hey man, you know, I, I thought this was going to be, man, they, they, our, our, my, my health is more important. You know, these, these stairs. And I'm like, well, in Florida, if there's more than three stories, it's required to have an elevator. So if there's five, you got to have an elevator. If there's three, you're carrying. It. And trust me, you try to deliver a chewy box to the bottom of the stairs, you'll hear about it because they'll complain about it because they uh-huh. ordered it for a reason to get delivered to their front door, not put stairs and take a picture and leave it at the bottom of the stairs. So I do spend some time going to pick those up because, you know, the station to kind of give me a heads up. Hey, somebody called and said there's, there's a chew. I'm like, how heavy is that? And they're like, uh, it says 140, 140 pounds. So I got to call another person to come help me. Cause I'm not going to carry that up there. Yeah. So I had a UPS driver help me one day. <laughs> he, he grabbed one in and he was just like, man, this is ridiculous. I was like, you telling me, but yeah, I mean, overall it's been fun. But like I said, my reason for kind of exiting is like I said, do other things, obviously other business ventures. Um, I, I think, like I said, I still have a, you know, a, a learning that I'll, I'll still keep continuing with FedEx, but um, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, when it's, it's like it's like LeBron. When it's your time to go, you know, it's time to time to get out of there. If you can't perform, and not saying I can't perform at peak, but it's just one of those things. I think getting out, you know, when we have those days off for Christmas, Thanksgiving, the six holidays that FedEx give me, I mean, it's like I don't know what to do. I mean, I don't know what to do with myself. I mean, I couldn't imagine having two days off in a row where I don't have to do DRO. I mean, it's like going through withdrawals or something. So yeah, and and I, you know, there's 
I see this all the time where there's people where it's like, I know that I could build the business in a way where I give up some time and energy, but like, that's just not in me. That's not, my personality won't let that happen. And and I, I totally understand that. And, and, you know, it's always uh, your choice and, and it's always something that you can decide. This, this is something where it's all about the structure you want to build. Uh, you know, one question here is though, you know, for our, what's the most challenging part that you think right now in terms of dealing with the drivers on a normal day? Um, hmm, not not too much of a normal, not not an everyday thing, but I will say, pay comes up like maybe <laughs> eh, once every two three months. You know, they they want to be paid more. Um, and like I said, based on my structure, I mean, like I said, most of my drivers, uh, I have some fixed ones because I do have business routes. Um, obviously. You know, I, I can't I can't put them on a stop bonus. I mean, the ones that I do, I kind of have them set to a little bit to where, you know, obviously, you know, I'll tell you, you know, 150 bucks for 120 stops. Every stop over 120, you get a dollar. So basically, guess what? If you do 170 stops, you make two hundred dollars for the day. Um, and they're over ten thousand pound vehicles, too. So uh, so you're able to kind of deal with that. Uh, but also you run into the fact. Yeah, they, they get me every day because, like I said, I have those drivers, those one I'm talking about. They could do 280 stops. So I'm uh -huh. just sitting here like, oh, and and trust me, you you'll never see it to where once you get drivers that that know that they make that commission, that stop bonus. Oh man, I've I've had drivers where I had to sit there and tell them, hey, don't take his stops because I'll look at the thing and I'm like, why is he delivering over here? And then I'll go to the driver that's on the business route and I'm like, hey, did you give stops to him? He's like, well, he said he wanted them. No, you're on a fixed route. Why stop doing it? Because I'm going to start taking it away from you. And yeah. and like I said, believe it or not, you put your guys on a stop bonus like that and you incentivize them. Trust me, when when 930, which is a cut time where we have to leave, they're, they're sitting there like looking down the belt to try to see if hey, that is mine. That's mine. And, and, and they want to take it, you know, uh -huh. because they want the stops. Because like I said, 30 smalls that come by express that, you know, even though they decide to leave at 930, which we're obligated to per the contract. You leave 40 stops. I mean, there's a good chance you'll get it tomorrow. But with my operation, I utilize AVP vehicles also. And I've seen that being very profitable. Um, I have about three AVPs that I have come in at 10 o'clock. And guess what? If there's Express that's late, oh, they get that scanned. And, you know, their, their structure is totally different. So yeah. the driver that just left and left 30 to 40 stops on the table, I mean, that was 30 or 40 bucks. And then guess what? I move them over. But I do see the difference when you do that. Like I said, you have drivers that are not, they want to, they want that money, you know, because when you add up 20 or 30 stops a day, that, that turns into a lot of money that you're leaving on the table every month. Yeah. And we would do a really similar structure where we would do the the daily rate plus the the incentive threshold above a certain number of stops. And you're right. It, I mean, it, it's great from an efficiency perspective when you can get those guys that really want to take those stops and you can eliminate routes. It's great, but you do have to be really careful to make sure that they're not doing so many stops that you're just getting crushed on payroll. So it is that kind of give and take of, you know, I, I have tears in my eyes sometimes when I do payroll, I'm, I'm like, I'm like, Oh man. I was like, God dang, like, where, where do you get these stops from? And then, uh, then you also notice when they do that, um, you know, you, you got the stops for freaking mail rooms, you know, they're supposed to do individual stops when they go to the apartment, but I swear I got some that they'll sit in the mail room and deliver 30 stops in the <laughs> mail room. And I sit here and look at the times and I'm like, dude, what, why do you, why do you go negative? Every day? Just, why why are you negative every day? Uh -huh. You know, the FedEx will scan, you know, cause sometimes the system might say you have 250, you know, you have 250 stops. But then when I look at the DSW, you know, somehow he delivered 271 last night. And I'm like, okay, whatever. I mean, as long as I get paid for it, I'll do it. I was oh. like, they don't double stop it. But I'm like, I I'm going to keep an eye on you. Because like I said, I got a couple that I know they're, 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 they're all on their money. I mean, they they write it down on the scanner and everything. And I'm like, well, you can't use the scanner because it's not always correct. Because a stop will count as something I don't get paid for. Like a stop right. that's closed. I don't get paid. You don't, I mean, we don't get paid for a 04, a business closure. We don't get paid for 07, which means you can't directly deliver it. We don't get paid for any codes, a 34 or holiday. We don't get paid for that stuff. So the driver would try to add that up and say, oh, the stop. No, that, that's not a stop I get paid for. So you don't you don't get paid yeah. for that. Yeah, because the, the goal is ultimately I'm creating more profitability for myself. And so I'm willing to pay you more. And so that's that's always the give and take you're trying to line. I think sometimes their goal is to bankrupt me. You know? <laughs> I think that's their goal. 
Oh, man. Okay, well, that's all we got time for today, Marlon. So I, I really appreciate you being on here. And everybody who's on here, everybody who's watching on YouTube, we've got all of the information on Marlon's route. So if you have any questions about that, reach out to our team and we can get you all those details, anything you need on that, or set up a call with Marlon to, to talk through it again. Uh, but Marlon, thank you so much for being here, being willing to kind of talk through your story and, and, and share all of this with all the interested uh, clients who are on. Thanks. It was great to be here. And like I said, it's, it's been a fun journey. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Thanks everybody for joining and we will see all of you next week on the next webinar. Thanks.